if separation of church and state, this religious philosophy that I've defined, is as corrupt and anti-Christian as it is. In fact, it's, it's virtually the same thing as secularism. And secularism is an anti-Christian religion of a corruptive type. What do you say about churches and church traditions which espouse separation of church and state, which is almost universal. The, I attend the Baptist church. I, I uh, support it every week. I attend it every week. Uh, and yet, the Baptist heritage and that Baptist uh, church believes in separation of church and state. So what am I to say about that? And I can only say one thing. I say the same thing I say about Catholicism. That is, this is a version of professed Christianity. It's all we have, essentially, by way of Christian profession, organized Christianity. Uh, to support the name of Christ, identify with the gospel, I have to identify with the church of some kind, I, and I have no choice. The point is that all the churches, or nearly all the churches, have an element in them. And I'm simply saying that this is a corruptive influence. The separation of church and state is a leavening uh, source of compromise in our churches. Now to carry through on this, and try to describe the nature of how this, uh, the doctrine of separation of church and state corrupts our churches how it actually corrupts church practice and thought. I want to go to Jefferson and to go back to the 18th century, read from Jefferson, from his notes on the state of Virginia. Virginia was sort of the nucleus of the United States of, of America. My uh, French-Canadian ancestors would refer to the United States of America as the Republic of Virginia. And it may be that I'm watching all these Walton replays because I'm trying to connect with this phenomenon of the Republic of Virginia. But here we go back to the root source, the Republic of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson establishing separation of church and state, and doing so in the following terms that will be useful in explaining how separation of church and state corrupts our churches, is a corruptive influence that should be rid of. And some churches have gotten rid of it. Dr. MacArthur, the head of Grace Community Church, uh, I met him in his office on the 16th of June, 1994, and asked him if he believed in separation of church and state. He said, obviously I don't. Nobody can, no Christian can believe in separation of church and state because it contradicts the kingdom of heaven, just what I've told you. But other churches don't understand that. They, don't, they can't comprehend it, and therefore they're in a compromised condition, don't even know that they're being compromised. Now, I want to describe what this compromise does, how it works, by going back to Thomas Jefferson in his definition of this philosophy and the following passage from his uh, notes on the state of, of Virginia, query number 17, religion. Quote, The present state of our laws on the subject of religion is this. The Convention of May 1776, in their Declaration of Rights, declared to be a truth and a natural right that the exercise of religion should be free. So that's the second point of those three points that I gave before. The same convention repealed all acts of Parliament which had rendered criminal the maintaining any opinions in matters of religion. Let me repeat that. They repealed all acts of Parliament which had rendered criminal the maintaining any opinion, opinions in matters of religion. Now, see, that's his effort to get rid of the state church Protestant phenomenon in which states espouse theology and then criminalize people who differ with them. So the American way is to get rid of the criminalizing of folk who don't measure up to the national religion. Now, what that translates into in the modern world in all of our churches is that we have to live in a society which has decided to totally decriminalize opposition to the Christian faith. This is the crux theme of separation of church and state, is that you're living in a system that has decided by constitution to decriminalize opposition to the Christian faith. In earlier times, kingdoms that would espouse Christianity would criminalize people who would deviate from Christianity, and that would become the coercive element I'm referring to. Now that raises the issue. Again, biblical Christianity. Does biblical Christianity criminalize non-believers? Does biblical Christianity treat as criminal people who are not Christians? It certainly does. And in fact, all of our Orthodox churches, all of our Baptist churches, uh, historically the Catholic Church, have a criminal sanction. What do you do with a criminal? Well, you punish him. You convict him and punish him. And all the gospel preachers, historically, are preaching from their pulpits that if you do not become a Christian, when you die, you'll go to hell. So through teaching the doctrine of hell, the Orthodox retain an element of criminalizing opposition to the Christian faith. But this is the catch. And this is where the corruptive ev uh, element exists and where we can see it and I can feel it even in my Baptist church. A preacher tell you, in effect, that it's criminal in the eyes of God not to be Christian. It's rebellion against God. 
and that men will be punished for it, but only in the afterlife. That's the key. That's the crux to everything. They'll tell you they keep riveting an attention over and over again on what's going to happen to you when you die. What happened to him when he died? Did he go to heaven? Did he go to hell? Where did he go when he died? That's the great song and dance that you hear in all the local churches. What's going to happen to you when you die? What's the problem with that? Why is that a, a compromised position, just to be riveting attention on death and what happens to a person when they die? It is a source of compromise. It is a source of corruption, and it is a source of compromise with, uh, with the separation of church and state. To confine the, the criminality of a non-believer simply to what happens to him when he dies. Why? Because the heads of our churches, and everybody knows that the secularist being who he is, the non-believer being who he is, doesn't believe in hell believe in heaven, he doesn't believe in hell, or if he does believe in heaven without much depth and without much accuracy, and he doesn't believe in hell, he puts that out of his mind. For the most part, he doesn't believe that people have souls. Therefore, he does not believe in an afterlife. Therefore, if the preachers keep preaching that people are going to go to hell for not being Christian, that's a kind of nuisance value item to them, but it doesn't challenge them. It doesn't put them on red alert. It doesn't concern them very much, and therefore there's a compromise or an easy peace formed between the churches that keep saying, what's going to happen to you when you die? And these secularists out here in the American society say, well, we don't care. I don't care what happens to me when I die. They're not concerned about the issue. It doesn't, it doesn't impinge on them. The only thing that would bother them would be to restore some degree of inquisition, some degree of crusade, some degree of criminalizing non-Christians in this life visibly and historically. They say, we'll give you the afterlife, the secularists do. And it makes for a compromised, active peace between the secularists and the preachers as long as they keep saying, oh, when a man dies, oh boy, God's against him if he's not a Christian and he'll send him to hell. And they keep preaching that, but they don't preach the rest of the gospel. They don't preach the rest of the counsel of God, and that is that the sanction and the criminalization of the non-Christian goes beyond the afterlife and involves concrete history and actual world events. That's what the separation of church and state doctrine is trying to get rid of, and you can't get rid of it if you're a Christian. Now here's an example in scripture of the kind of thing that pastor after pastor and church after church, I've seen this happen since 1980, they're, they're moving away from what we call apocalyptic doctrine. They're moving away from apocalyptic doctrine in droves. They're de-emphasizing it. They say, we believe it, but they don't preach out. They don't mention it. Why are the preachers fleeing from apocalypse? Because true apocalyptic reality, apocalyptic hope, and apocalyptic thought is the one thing that drops the mask from the compromise of separation church and state. It's the one thing that shows that the entire system is a great lie. Now, I'll try to show why this is. Matthew 24, verse 37. For the coming of the Son of Man, that's an apocalyptic event, the return of Christ. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Now what happened in the days of Noah? God criminalized the world and mass executed humanity. Do we all understand that? That again is why the secularist will do whatever he can to suppress the biblical account of origins in Genesis. Because this is the part of the Christian faith that doesn't go down in a compromised way. The flood of Noah carries certain implications. Because we're not talking in that case about pe people being sent to hell in an afterlife. We're talking about people being mass executed for some crime about to not being Christian. Now we need to read further in the passage to see what their crime was. In the Old Testament the statement was that they were practicing violence. That's not what Christ says. He doesn't contradict it. But Christ talks about the criminalization of the Diluvian world. An entire world was wiped out except for eight people. And it was because they were criminals in God's eyes. And as he said, the end of all flesh has come up before me, and that I repent that I even made these people. Uh, they're criminals, and they needed to be executed. They were executed by drowning. Interesting mo mode of execution, but that's how they were executed. Now, what was their crime? And this is, goes right into the center of the 18th century culture, right into the center of our system of, sec of separation church and state. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just as in the days of Noah. And then he begins to define the crime of the Diluvians. For as in those days, which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now that doesn't look much like a crime. <laughs> they were 
acting like people in Walton's Mountain. They were being decent people. They were eating and drinking. We need to do that to stay alive. And they were marrying and giving in marriage. We need to do that to stay genetically alive. So they were being good conservatives, or as some conservatives would falsely say, occupying till, uh, till he come, which means uh, compromising till he come. They were, they were <laughs> basically just doing normal human affairs. They were, they were sustaining life, in other words. And your basic 18th century secularist, with his system of separation church and state, is out to sustain life. He doesn't want any more religious wars like the Thirty Years' War in, in Germany. And therefore, he's simply saying, give us a kind of world in which we can get along long enough to just sustain life and eat and drink and marry and give in marriage. But what's wrong? We still we don't have any, a note of anything wrong. But now let's get the, the wrong part, the criminal part that caused the destruction of the world at the time of the flood. For as in those days which before the flood, they were eating, drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And then verse 39 defines their criminality. And it's a criminality that carries down to our own time. It's applicable to any time. God is in the business of mass executing people, mass executing whole worlds for this crime in verse 39. And they did not understand. They did not understand. That's a phrase that Christ used, uses. He uses it in the parable of soils to describe the non-believer. He says that the first soil, the, the seed was sown on that soil, but then as he interprets it, they did not understand. And then he goes on to describe the good soil, the only good soil, the fourth one. And he says, that they understood. Understanding is a word used for engagement with the Christian revelation. That is, uh, what we're being told there is that there was a world that was destroyed for just being ordinary, for just being normal, for just being common, for just being on Walton's mountain, and for uh, finding a means to stay alive, John Walton does, and then uh, encouraging his children to, to make, marry, and beget their kind and make a living. And yet they did not understand. And that phrase, they did not understand, means that they did not respond to the version of the Christian faith that existed in the days of Noah. And he's saying that the same thing will happen. All those who do not understand, and that's the phrase used here, all those who are not Christians, all those who are not born again, all those who have not engaged with the Christian faith because they think it's enough to eat and drink and marry and give in marriage and be normal like Walton's Mountain, are going to be mass executed. Now, the second time around, their execution takes a different form. It's not by water. We continue the text to, to describe the mass execution. They did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So he said the same principles will operate. The same secularism, the same feeling that all we need to do is to protect life and carry it on to the next generation and talk about the next generation. And uh, as, I, as I heard at PMC, mistakenly and corruptly, they said in a meeting there this last April, this last month, they said, our children are our future. Now, if you think that, if you say our children are our future, you are in this group, my friend. You're in this group. If you believe that your children are your future, you're among those who were marrying and giving in marriage and eating and drinking and who did not understand. We have a debt of charity to our children. We have an obligation to care for them. We have an obligation by the second dispensation to provide for them. So we have a debt to them of sorts, but no one who's a Christian and has the apocalyptic hope in his heart ever says, our children are our future. When you say that, you're completely erasing what? Imminency. And imminency is defined in this passage. Imminency means that where your hope is, is in the appearance of Jesus Christ himself, who was never a family man. He never got married. He never courted anybody. He never married anybody. And he never had any children. And that's where reality lies. And that's what they didn't understand, and that's what they don't understand when they make remarks such as, our children are our future. That's the kind of statement that comes out of that separation church and state secular philosophy, which is in our public schools, by the way, and which is unmistakably corruptive, and which is tantamount to not understanding, and therefore being lost as a goat, and not just going to hell when you die, but being subject to mass execution at Christ's second advent. Here's how he describes it. They did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there shall be two men in a field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken the other one left. That has been completely misapplied by this corrupt and confused system that we live in to the rapture. It has nothing to do with the rapture of the church. These people are taken away to destruction. They're in parallel with the people who are destroyed in the flood. So we're told that there'll be a kind of a 50-50 through the apocalyptic process that culminates in Christ's 
there will be a, a, a religious situation in which 50% or some percentage of the world's population will be non-believers, probably much higher now. But at this point, uh, there will be a percentage of people who are non-believers, and they will simply be eradicated, expelled, driven away. We don't know where. They're just, they're just gone. Then there will be two in a field, one will be taken. Two, two women will be grinding at the mill, and one will be taken, and one will be left. And therefore, the concluding ethic of it, verse 42 of Matthew 24, therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Now, that's the principle of imminency. Now, technically speaking, we believe that the coming of the Son of Man, the return of Christ, actually occurs at the end of a seven-year period. What's imminent is the beginning of that seven-year period. But the imminency principle remains. He says, be alert, be alert, be alert. It can happen at any moment. Be ready, folks. Uh, you had a group of people who didn't believe the flood was coming. They didn't believe that Noah's Ark really meant anything. And the same thing's happening to you. There are people who are talking about how our future are, is on our children, and they're out there uh, getting married, and they're out there uh, making money, and they're out there just living and eating and drinking. And they do not understand. And one thing they don't understand is what's in that verse challenging you to believe that you should be on the alert because instant change can come. Now, for believers, that instant change is overwhelmingly thrilling. It means that for believers in Christ, the primary event of the resurrection of the dead in Christ combined with the transformation of living Christians. And that means into immortality. And that immortality is so great that you have a, a verse like this. Uh, Hebrews 6.11, full assurance of hope until the end. The word for this imminent event is called the end. And look at that wording, full assurance of hope until the end. It's a point beyond which Hope is not necessary because you've passed over into something called glory, into an invulnerable, immortal condition in which you no longer have a sin nature, you no longer have death, you live a life of eternal euphoria. From that, That's what we're looking forward to. But the same apocalyptic event, which is overwhelmingly hopeful to the believer in 1 Corinthians 1.7 and 1 Peter 1.13, uh, is overwhelmingly hopeful to the believer, is desperately dire to the rest of the world, and we're told that in many passages in the Old Testament because the Jews, the, uh, the nation Israel, must go through the tribulation period. They're told, Amos 5.18, uh, woe to you uh, who, who are yearning for that day. That uh, day will overtake you as a thief. Uh, it'll, it'll be a day of darkness and so forth because this transformation will not occur to these people. And those who do not understand, like those who rejected uh, Noah's flood, are in jeopardy for their lives, in jeopardy to be mass executed for the crime of not understanding. That's what Christ says. Do we understand this? Let's just repeat this again. Christ defines the, the crime, that he defines world destruction and the annihilation of mankind in terms of simply not understanding. And that means not being Christian. And therefore Christ says, point blank, that it is criminal not to be uh, a Christian. And the important point out of that passage is, we're not talking about the afterlife. We're not talking about what happens when a man dies. We're talking about public events. He's talking about the flood. The flood was not something that happened after somebody died. It was something that caused them to die in history, visibly. So we're talking about a visible, concrete, historical event which is imminent and which he says is imminent and which means the mass annihilation and the execution of the, of the human race, all of those who do not understand. And who are they? They're people who are getting married and eating and being conservative and just not engaging with the Christian gospel.